Hello and welcome back to The Professor Speaks. I'm Raphael Chacon, director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture in Missoula, Montana in the Western United States. And it's a pleasure to bring you back, welcome you back to our course on Roman and early Christian art. Today we're continuing the saga of the Roman emperors and we're gonna be discussing the, uh, the Flavian family, that is the family that followed the Julio-Claudians Julio on the imperial throne in ancient Rome. We're gonna divide this, uh, this lecture into two parts. First to talk about the, the ninth emperor, his name was Vespasian, the first Flavian emperor. And then the second part will deal with the heirs of Vespasian. So, um, so without much ado, let us begin by uh, sharing the screen and opening up our PowerPoint uh, to discuss the Flavian family. So as I mentioned, the Flavians followed the Julio-Claudians, that is the descendants of Augustus, Caesar Augustus, on the imperial throne. And the first emperor of the Flavian clan was a man by the name of Vespasian, uh, a very important emperor, a long-serving emperor. And so we'll talk about Vespasian. And then in part two of this series, we will look at the descendants, his son Titus, and then the uh, successive heirs, Domitian and Nerva. So let's begin by talking about the Flavians. Now, you might have noticed that I mentioned that Vespasian was, was the ninth emperor. So that means that there was a gap between the Julio-Claudians and the ascension of the Flavian clan to the imperial throne. So remember that in the year 68, Nero, the last of the Julio-Claudians, committed suicide, ending that, uh, that dynasty that ruled um, the empire for uh, the first, uh, the first uh, decades of its uh, existence. And, uh, and then there was, in fact, this year known as the year of the four emperors. So there was a succession, uh, if you will, there was a power struggle for the uh, control of the, of the state. And uh, in one year, Rome experienced four individuals who rose to power and fell. Um, and none of them was able to consolidate power. So, uh, so after Nero, a man by the name of Galba ruled, and he was murdered by the Praetorians. Remember, the Praetorians played an enormous role. They were the protectors of the emperor, and yet at times turned against the man selected to be the ruler. So Galba was murdered by his own guard. Uh, Otto, in 69, uh, later in 69, was also defeated and forced to commit suicide. And then Vitellius uh, was also defeated uh, and uh, could not uh, assume the power that was necessary to take control of the state. So in one year, Rome experienced four uh, emperors in rapid succession. Uh, here's an image of one of those men, Galba, and this is a marvelous sculpture in the Vatican Museum. And again, it's one of those strange pastiche sculptures where uh, various elements from different sculptures were put together uh, to form this, uh, this image of an emperor uh, seated on a throne. Again, but this is in some ways, it's a modern uh, uh, composition, uh, really not an ancient sculpture of Galba. But there is a portrait there, the head, the bust portrait of Galba, a man who uh, hoped to become emperor and never succeeded uh, in that. So again, uh, Vespasian is the man who, after that uh, very unstable year in Roman politics, would then assume absolute power over the state. And then he was followed um, likewise by his son Titus and then uh, successive heirs. So let's talk a little bit about Titus Flavius Caesar Vespasianus Augustus, uh, Vespasian as he became known. Uh, he was born in November of the year, uh, uh, November 17th, the year nine, and died in the year 79. So he had a very long life. Uh, he came from a family that rose to power during the rise of the Julio-Claudians, particularly in the Senate. So he was an aristocrat. And he had, in fact, uh, quite a few numerous uh, military campaigns where he succeeded as well, certainly in Britain, uh, but primarily in Judea, that is modern day Palestine, um, in uh, the, what we call the Holy Land today. Um, and it was there where he quelled a rebellion in 66. He became well known as a general at that point uh, and, uh, and to much acclaim back home in, 
in Rome. And then after the year of Nero's suicide in the year of the four emperors, that is in 68-69, um, he was named emperor, uh, defeating Vitalius in December of that year, and then the Senate declared him emperor. He, in fact, ruled for a very long time. He ruled for 27 years. His, actually, the clan ruled, his family ruled for 27 years, making them among the longest serving dynasties in, in Roman imperial history. But there's actually scant information about his own 10 year rule uh, within that dynasty, but he did do some impressive uh, construction projects, particularly the Roman amph uh, the Flavian Amphitheater, which eventually is, uh, became known as the Colosseum. So that massive structure, which is there today in Rome, is actually the, the, the greatest uh, achievement, architectural certainly, engineering achievement of the Flavian dynasty, and that happened during the rule of Aspasian. And then in the year 79, he was succeeded by his eldest son, Titus. And 79 is a very, very important year in, uh, in Roman history. We'll talk about that at the end of this, uh, of this conversation. So Titus, by the way, was his natural son, and he really is the first biological son to inherit the Roman throne. Um, so remember, uh, prior to this, none of the emperors were, in fact, biological descendants of their fathers, but rather were uh, uh, adopted by, uh, by the, um, the previous emperor. So here are some bust portraits of Vespasian. He was a, actually a quite uh, a recognizable figure uh, in, in Roman art, uh, particularly in these naturalistic bust portraits. And, and he's unmistakably Vespasian. Um, he had a rather bulbous nose, uh, a balding pate. He was an older man when he assumed the throne, uh, but a very confident figure. And this is typical of the, the image of Vespasian that we have uh, from art history. Um, it's uh, a likeness that's also quite apparent in the coins. For example, there's a coin in the upper left that shows you, uh, that actually commemorates the, his uh, successes in Judea, the coin, uh, the image on the back side. So one side, the, uh, the front image has the image of the emperor in profile. And then on the back side, we have an image of, of um, uh, def Judea defeated, so that's the female figure that you see there, the mourning figure next to the palm tree. Uh, and that is, of course, a, a scene that is symbolic of his military campaigns and his victories in that region of the Roman Empire. So, and by the way, incidentally, the coin down below shows Domitilla, um, one of the, uh, his uh, family members uh, down below. And there's another bust portrait of, of uh, the very recognizable image of Vespasian, uh, the emperor. He always has a kind of funny smile on his face, a, ben a beneficent smile. Um, so a man of great power and, uh, and, and uh, apparently great confidence as a ruler. Here's another likeness of him a little bit later in time. Uh, he's, he's shown older here. So it's, what's interesting about these portraits is unlike the images of Augustus and his immediate heirs, which tried to make, uh, make the emperor idealized, these portraits are actually more in that veristic tradition, the naturalistic tradition of, of Roman um, Republican portraits. Um, so, so there is no attempt to hide his wrinkles or his age here. He is the man uh, as he was known in his day. Uh, and the, and uh, the likenesses therefore are, are very convincing. Uh, here's another one of these strange images where we have a naturalistic portrait in the head and then a body, a heroic body. So again, that kind of strange uh, uh, fantasy of, of Roman sculpture where we have the emperor shown as a, a god, a deity, as a hero, uh, at, uh, or an ephebe in, uh, in his uh, youthful beauty um, and vigor. Um, but nevertheless, that's definitely his likeness on this uh, Apollonian body. And then there's an image of Flavia Domitilla, his daughter. Um, and there's lots and lots of images of the imperial household, particularly of the women. And notice that there's been obviously some changes in the fashions of the hairstyles. And we're gonna see that even more so in the Flavian period in these female portraits. It's a sort of rather generic image of Flavia Domitilla, but a very beautiful uh, attention to uh, the details of her coiffure. Here's another interesting image of Domitilla, and this is an image that was um, stolen from a museum in, uh, in Libya, in Tripoli, and it was uh, not too long ago returned to that museum, repatriated. It's a smallish uh, bust portrait of Domitilla in, in fragments, but nevertheless, it's an image of the, uh, the Empress. 
And then here's another interesting image of a Flavian, a member of the Flavian household. This is uh, Julia Titi Flavia, and, uh, and a, a marvelous likeness as well. But, uh, but what's really interesting here is that beautiful attention to the coiffure. And it's a new hairstyle for uh, Roman women in this period um, in the first century, the end of the first century AD. Uh, this is my favorite of all the Flavian portraits, uh, including the images of the emperor. This is an image of a Flavian lady. We don't know who this woman is, but it's a marvelous, marvelous sculpture in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. Um, and of course, what, uh, what is remarkable about the sculpture is not just the turn of the head, the beautiful uh, features of the face, etc. a woman kind of at, uh, at the prime of life, uh, a Roman matron at the time of the prime of life. But what is truly remarkable is that beautiful hairdo, um, you know, the curls, the, the, the towering uh, hair. Uh, and let me just show you the backside of that image where you have the hair braided and wrapped uh, in the back and then the coiffure pushed to the front. This is a remarkable, remarkable sculpture. And it tells us about how, how beauty was important to this imperial court. It wasn't just simply power and, uh, and manifestations of power. But it was really, uh, and they did that through, you know, the body and through uh, the hairdo and the style and the fashions of the time. So this was, of course, uh, a, an aristocratic woman, uh, a patrician woman. Um, only an individual of that stature could have her bust portrait done like this. Um, and it's quite a sensitive image, uh, a, truly a remarkable masterpiece from Roman, uh, all of Roman art. So um, what I want to address now, though, is the, the, the most important contribution to the landscape in uh, ancient Rome. And so I'm showing you a map of the city. And this is actually in the fourth century. So we're talking uh, many centuries after the time of, of um, Vespasian and the, and the Flavian emperors. But what I want to show you, though, that is at the heart of the Roman city, the Roman capital, of course, is the Roman Forum. And at the end of the Roman Forum, down in the southeastern corner of it, you remember that that is where Nero had built a fabulous, impressive palace, sort of occupying the southern end of the Roman Forum. And to the chagrin of some people who felt that the Roman Forum was in fact a sacred place where the, the, uh, the Via Sacra, the sacred road, went through it up to the Capitoline Hill between the hills of the Esquiline and the Palatine and up to the Capitoline. And that space was sacred and that Nero had somehow defiled it by building his palace there. Well, the Flavians believed that as well and they tore down that palace and they built over the lake of the, the palace, they built a, a very impressive structure and that is what we call the Colosseum today. So let me show you this image of this wonderful model of Rome in the fourth century. And it shows you, in fact, a landscape that is quite familiar to us today. So on the upper left side of your screen, what you see there is the Capitoline Hill with its great temples. That is the, the power nexus, if you will, of the Roman capital, the most important hill. And then the second most important, arguably, the second uh, or, or equally important hill is the Palatine Hill, where the Roman emperors built their palaces following in the steps of Augustus with the Circus Maximus below it down there in the southwestern uh, side of the city along the Tiber. And then what you notice in the southeastern side is in fact the Colosseum, this enormous uh, oval structure uh, built specifically for games that were celebrated there where the Roman population was allowed to uh, partake in gladiatorial sports and all kinds of feats of, of heroism and, uh, and battle, uh, symbolic battle that is. Um, and so thousands of people would gather there on a regular basis in the ancient world to watch these games or to see the emperor and the court. Um, uh, and, and it was, in fact, a public amenity. It was built for the Roman people by Vespasian and his court uh, in some ways to, uh, as a gift uh, to them. And the games that were celebrated there were public gifts and often food was distributed, what money was distributed um, in, in order to keep the population, the rabble, if you will, happy and contented. But it was on that site where Nero had built his, his palace and Vespasian made sure that that palace was erased uh, and that this structure uh, was built over, over it. 
So a very, very imp uh, important uh, contribution to the Roman Forum and to the Roman uh, landscape, the cityscape. So the Via Sacra actually pen com comes through uh, alongside the Colosseum and then continues on up to the Capitoline Hill in the upper left corner of your image. And notice how densely built by the fourth century that space was, but there was still a road that meandered through there. Well, um, that, uh, that structure that the Colosseum was built there uh, at the bottom of it, and then it would be followed by even larger structures surrounding it. And, and I'm showing you a map of the city walls and, um, and then some of the later structures, mostly bath, large bathhouses that were built by later emperors and aqueducts that would bring successive um, um, aqueducts built to bring water, fresh water into the, uh, the Roman capital. So here is another image of the wonderful Colosseum, that massive, massive structure. By the way, it is, it is technically known as the Flavian Amphitheater. The Colosseum, the name Colosseum derives from the fact that there was a statue, and you see it there to the left of the, the, uh, the model or the model of the Colosseum, um, a, a statue on a plinth, and that statue was a colossal statue. It was a an, an enormous statue of the Emperor Nero uh, as the god Apollo. And that statue was a part of the grounds. It was actually on the, on the grounds of the, um, the Palace of Nero. And it was when the palace was destroyed and leveled and the Colosseum built over the lake of that, of, on the grounds of Nero's palace, that statue was saved and it was moved to the site that you see here. Because of its association with, um, uh, with the Colosseum, the building then took its name, uh, sort of in, in the vernacular, took its name from the Colossus uh, of Nero. So let me show you an image that shows you uh, the remnants of Nero's palace. Notice the Bath of Trajan there. This is a much later structure, that large rectangular uh, structure that you see there on the upper part of your screen, reaching down into the lower left-hand corner of it. There was another later bath, the Baths of Titus, that was built there. These two structures are built over the remnants of, uh, of the, the Palace of Nero. And there, what you see in red is in fact the rooms that are left of the Palace of Nero that we saw in our previous uh, conversation. Um, let me show you another map of that. So everything that you see there in red is actually parts of the Baths of Trajan. Uh, and then what you see in black there at the top of the screen are the rooms, uh, the beautifully appointed rooms of the Palace of Nero. Those no longer existed because the Baths of Trajan were built on top of the, their ruins. Uh, but they were still there, if you will, in the basement of the Baths of Trajan. Uh, and here is, in fact, an image of the Palace of, of Nero as it looked in its day. Uh, so the palace buildings left and right, and then the, the lake, the artificial lake that was built, and then the statue there you see in a courtyard with uh, temples. And this was a very, very impressive structure, a very impressive uh, image of Nero as a god. Uh, all of that was destroyed. The, the buildings were leveled. The foundations were leveled. Some of the rooms survived uh, even to today below the foundations of later uh, buildings like the Baths of Trajan. Uh, okay, and so these are images. They're reconstructions, modern reconstructions of the, uh, of the, the, the Colosseum as it looked in the time of the Flavians. And let me lower this image here so that you can actually see a coin that shows you the Colosseum with uh, animals inside it, and then the Colossus of Nero standing next to it. And here is a later Renaissance painting. So this is a 16th, uh, 16th century or 17th century image of the Colosseum in its glory with, uh, as, as people envisioned it, with the statue of Nero next to it. And these are later 19th century images of that same, um, same idea. Uh, and again, the model of the city of Rome with the Colosseum here, these are the later baths that were built uh, over the ruins of Nero's temple. And this was built over the lake of uh, the grounds, on the grounds of Nero's uh, palace. And there is the Colossus. And just to give you a sense of the scale of that Colossus, here's this marvelous uh, National Geographic reconstruction of what that statue looked like. It was a statue of Apollo, only the face was the face of Nero. It was a generic enough statue that the Vespasian 
and his court decided to keep the statue. Plus, it was a very, very impressive structure. If you look in the lower left, you can see elephants hauling it, and that gives you a sense of its size in proximity to the Colosseum, to the amphitheater. And then here on the right, there's a wonderful little diagram that shows you that Nero's Colossus was 103 feet, only rivaled in the modern world by the Statue of Liberty, which is 111 feet. So literally, the statue was the same size as the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is only taller because its arm is extended with the torch uh, above it. So this was an, a very, very important structure in the ancient world. Of course, it was lost um, after the collapse of Rome, the building, the, the, the monument was melted down, the, the, the bronze was reused, recycled uh, into weapons and other, other, uh, uh, other equipment, uh, but it was one of the great um, wonders of the ancient world. Fortunately, the building itself, the Colosseum, has survived into modern times in relatively good shape. And by the way, incidentally, it is being currently restored in Rome today. They're spending millions of dollars, uh, both uh, the Italian state and the European Union, to, uh, to shore up this building to make sure that it survives another thousand years. Uh, and it's a very impressive um, restoration of the building and also an and it's an active archaeological site because they, they keep discovering more and more things about the way the structure was built and the way it was engineered. One of the, the telltale signs of this building, which was then becomes a model for future amphitheaters throughout the Roman world as far, uh, as far west as Spain and Portugal, as far east as, uh, as Mesopotamia, is this, this uh, notion of a freestanding uh, circular or oval structure with stands or bleachers inside for thousands of people, very, very efficiently designed so that people could enter it uh, quickly, fill it, and then could, it could be emptied uh, just as easily and quickly. And also the architectural language of it. So we have, in fact, the, the orders of Greek architecture along the walls of the building. The lowest level is in the, the fundamental Greek order, that is the Doric order. The middle tier is in the Ionic order. And the uppermost two tiers are in the, uh, in the Corinthian order. First in uh, engaged columns uh, next to these arches, and then above that cornice line in pilasters, that is flat members uh, uh, riveted to the walls itself, ending in the capitals, Corinthian capitals of a pilaster. It was a very, very impressive uh, structure, um, the, uh, this amphitheater. And here are some views of it, some early photographs, early 20th century photo, a photo on the left, and then a uh, mid 20th century image of it. You can see that mo it is a ruin. It is in fact like a, like a broken, tooth or a decayed tooth, um, the, the marble, the seats, all of the in, inner structure of the building has been gutted and looted over the last 2,000 years. Um, the building functioned as housing. It functioned in many, many ways over the last 2,000 years, but the shell of it has in fact persisted uh, into modern times. Uh, so these are aerial views of the Colosseum in modern, modern days. Uh, and just to give you a, an idea, it is in fact a fragment. So it is, uh, it's not intact, it's not whole, but there's enough there uh, to allow us to perceive what the building was like in its uh, original, uh, original day. A large portion of it was actually destroyed during the Renaissance. And that's one of the great ironies of uh, Renaissance uh, architecture, Renaissance art, is that in, in spite of the fact that architects greatly emulated the, uh, the works of the ancients. They also destroyed the works of the ancients to rebuild antiquity. So there is an anecdote about a pope allowing uh, family members to, uh, who, wanted to, who needed building materials for their own palaces in, uh, in Rome to actually loot the, uh, the, uh, the Colosseum for building materials, finished, dressed stones, that sort of thing. And this is an image of the, uh, the Colosseum during the Renaissance. This was done by the Dutch artist Jan Gossart um, in 1509. And again, here's a, a portion, uh, an image that shows you the portion the outer of the outer wall, the ring, the annular ring of the building that was removed during the Renaissance, during the 16th and 17th centuries to build many Renaissance and Baroque palaces, uh, leaving only the inner, uh, the inner layers of the uh, 
of this onion of a building. Uh, and, and this is actually a good photograph to show you the outermost wall and then some of the inner uh, rings of the uh, concentric rings of the structure itself. Okay, and I think on that note, we will end our discussion. We've come to the end of our conversation about Vespasian's rule, and we'll pick up with his son, uh, Titus, in part two. <laughs>